right, good morning. Turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5 still. <clears throat> Been studying the Sermon on the Mount, that's chapters 5 through 7. And the, uh, as we looked at, this is really, you know, Christ's foundational teaching. As he taught in the synagogues and things, I think we can be, um, we can kind of know that this is like the foundation of it. These are the things that he taught wherever he went. And so um, if you would stand with me as we read the Bible, as we read the Word of God, we'll read from verses 21 to verse 30. <clears throat> Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder but whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment but I say to you whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire therefore if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him. Let your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And so let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do humbly come before your throne, your pre come into your presence, Lord. And as we read your word, as we seek to understand it, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come and give understanding, give us um, the meaning, Lord. Speak to our hearts, Lord. I pray that the epiphany would happen, the light would come on, Lord, for us as we as we look into your word. And, and wherever we are, we're each individual is, you know them individually, Lord. I pray that you would minister and, and speak into their lives what they need to continue to fight the good fight of faith, Lord, to stand strong in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we get into the Sermon on the Mount, we looked at the Beatitudes and um, we looked at them, they're not the do attitudes. Always remember that. They're not the do attitudes, they're the be attitudes. It's, it's the character that God desires for us being his people, his, um, being Christians. And so, um, blessed has the idea of happiness, right? And so we all want to be happy. I think if I ask us all in this room, how many of you want to be happy? Would you raise your hand? You know, I just um, got this when I was sitting there. A little bit, a quote out of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So it's our right given by our creator to pursue happiness. So it's a good thing that we want to be happy. But the thing is, we have to pursue happiness in, in God's way. And that's what he says there in these first verses. And there may be, they may be not, they don't line up with what we may have thought would make us happy. 
When we were unbelievers, we pursued things that we hoped would make us happy, but they brought destruction. So he starts off there, blessed are the poor in spirit. That word poor just brings in, you know, it doesn't make sense in a, in a worldly way. So we, we want to pursue happiness, but we need to pursue it in God's way. God gave us the right, and God gave us the way. And so um, the Christian character, they're summed up in the Beatitudes. And then verses 17 through 20, Jesus taught us that he came to fulfill the law, not to get rid of the law. Jesus fulfilled the law for us. We found last time we studied this that there is no way that we could ever do that, but Jesus came and he lived that perfect man and he died in our stead. He fulfilled the law, but the law is still useful to us, we looked at. And then we saw that the Christian character there in verse 20, and we'll look at this again. Let's read verse 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And um, though the scribes and the Pharisees were very religious people outwardly, um, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And that's what we're going to look at as we go forward. Jesus is going to kind of explain to us and bring clarity to the Old Testament. Maybe what the scribes and the Pharisees had kind of missed, had, had they missed um, in their interpretation, in their practice, Jesus is going to clarify with us. So the first thing is that the law is spiritual, Right? We're going to look at two different laws in, in particular, thou shalt not murder and thou shalt not commit adultery. Those are taken out of the Ten Commandments. We're all familiar with the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. The first four deal with our relationship with God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. And these are summarizing them. Verse 7. In Exodus 20, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You shall do no work. So those first ones have to do with our relationship with God. And we, we remember that in the Talmud, you know, the Talmud is this uh, vast volume of Jewish tradition. You have the Old Testament that they had. And then they had the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the oral traditions written down around the second century AD. And the Mishnah kind of helped us or helped the Jews um, understand what the Old Testament laws did. So when it said, thou shalt not work, what does that mean? Thou shalt not work. And we went into this last time, if you remember. And then the Gemara was further interpretation of the Mishnah and so the, um, I don't know if you have that picture up there but that there's a whole volume of explanations that these guys would kind of memorize and they're very meticulous in this thing and I just want to read a couple of them to remember to remind us uh, to carry a burden was considered work to the Jew and um, food equal in weight to a dried fig, enough wine for mixing in a goblet, milk enough for one swallow, honey enough to put upon a wound, oil enough to anoint a small member of your body, water enough to moisten an eye salve, paper enough to write a customs house notice upon it, ink enough to write two letters of the alphabet, read enough, to make it. So if you carried anything, any one of these things, you'd be in violation of that commandment of God. So they're very meticulous in these things. And then the second um, list of commandments from the Ten Commandments have to do with our relationship with our fellow man. Verse 12 of Exodus 20, honor your father and your mother. Remember that, kids, <laughs> especially mine. 
You shall not murder. We'll look at that one in a second. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. So what, is these, what do these actually mean? And that's what Jesus is going to clarify for us. He had to kind of clarify it for the people of his day. And I think that we can be safe to say that Jesus needs to clarify it for the people of our day. Would you, would you agree with me? No? If you agree with me, say amen or something. <laughs> we all have our own ideas, and Jesus has a way of coming into our lives, and he has to kind of work out and work through those ideas to implant his ideas, his will. He has to change our thinking to conform with his thinking. And if you think you've arrived there, that just proves to you you have not ar arrived there. You, know, you still have more work to do. God still has more work to do in your life. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were very religious people. Understand this. They were very religious. But Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. What does that mean? You know, they did everything outwardly, didn't they? They were very meticulous in their observance of the Old Testament law, the Mishnah, the Gemara, the whole Talmud. They, they, anything, they wanted to get their hand, and they wanted to live by it. They were very religious people. Jesus said to them in Matthew 23, verses, verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hic hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint, and ice and cumin. Just every little thing, they made sure that they... We're giving God a tenth of it. They, they wanted to live by the law. They wanted to do the right thing. They were very religious people. Ancient records describe how scribes and lawyers would argue for days of uh, whether it was legal for a man to wear his false teeth on the Sabbath. Because there were those who said that, well, that was carrying a burden. And so, you know... If you have false teeth, please take them out before you walk. You know, I don't know. It, 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 you know. And because they were so meticulous about these outward regulations, they thought that they had obtained righteousness. They thought that they were righteous. But just because, listen to this, just because they were religious people does not mean that they were spiritual people. Just because they were religious people does not mean that they were spiritual people. Because Jesus, in Matthew 23, at the last part of that verse, he said, I'll read the whole verse to you. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe, tithe the mint and ice and cumin, all these meticulously outward things that you're observing. But you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. What were the weightier matters of the law? Justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. See, the second part, the weightier matter, it's the spiritual matter. It's the spiritual matter. You could do all the right things but with the wrong motive. You can do all the right things, but be really carnal on the inward man. It's just not outward, but inward. But it's just not inward, it's outward. That's what Jesus is saying here. You should have done those things. What you're doing is right. It's good. But it's not coming from the heart. It should come from the heart and you should do those things. It's so again, it's just not outward, but it's inward. But it's just not inward, it's outward. There has to be worse. Your faith without works is dead, according to James. So from verse 21 to the end of the chapter, Jesus tells what the law was meant to be. You know? And Paul kind of explains this in Romans in chapter 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. The law is spiritual, but I am carnal, 
sold under sins. And so the scribes and Pharisees, they didn't really quite grasp this. Therefore, they really missed the purpose of the law. You know, I, I, as I said earlier, I was a missionary right after the fall of communism and I went into this town in Baia, Hungary in 1991 and, uh, you know, preached the gospel to people maybe that had never heard it before and so forth. But one of the things that um, I, I did is I visited uh, the cemetery because there used to be a large population of Jews in this town in Baia, Hungary. But of course, Nazism had, had um, reduced the amount of Jews there and other places in Europe. But as you go into the graveyard there in Baia, Hungary, they had these ornate Jewish tombs that you can go visit to this day, you know. And they, they're beautiful. They're, they're sculpted. They have intricacies on them. I mean, they, still to this day, they've lasted and they're very beautiful. But we all know what's on the inside of that tomb, don't we? Death. Death. And that's what religion is. On the outward, it looks good. But on the inside, it's death. It's death. And that's what Jesus told them in Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 and 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also appear outwardly righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You know, and sometimes as human beings, just being a man on the face of this planet or a woman on the face of this planet, there's a tendency to us to only live by the natural man. You know, so we can't point the fingers, really, can we, at the, at the scribes and the Pharisees because when we're pointing at them, we're really pointing at ourselves because we kind of tend to be like that, too. Let's just be honest with this. We, we tend towards that. We have to fight against that to remain spiritual people because we're carnal, soul under sin. And only by the work of Jesus Christ can he free us. But the temptation is to drift back there. There's a tendency to it. Jesus explains spiritually what the law means. And then he clears up the wrong interpretations of his day. You see, they spent all of their time interpreting what the law meant externally, as I said but they neglected the inward, the, the, the place that really counts. They neglected the heart. They were carnal men. They cared about what happened on the outside, but they were not spiritual men. Because they neglected the inward. They neglected the heart. And, and as I said over and over again, understand God cares about what goes on on the inside of you. You know? He, he doesn't really look at what's the outward, what the outward man looks like, you know? In, when I got saved in, in, uh, Costa Mesa in 1985, you know, we played volleyball out of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa on Saturdays. And one Saturday, this giant of a man came and he appeared. His name was Kimo. He, was a, he lived on an island in the Hawaiian Islands and, um, you know, where only Hawaiians could live and basically grew up with a loin cough and spearing pigs and things like that. Uh, but he was a giant of a man, and, he, and um, he came out and he started playing volleyball with us. And he ended up getting saved through that. But before that, as we got to know his testimony, you know, his testimony was that um, he would travel around with a, with a Hawaiian show. He was, a, you know, doing the flame throwing and that kind of thing. And then the, he and his friends would go to a bar 
and beat everybody up in the bar. And I said, how, how many fights have you been in, Chemo? Chemo said, I have beaten over 200 men. And I have never been beaten. You know, I, I mean, it, and he didn't say that with pride at this point because he was Christian at this point. But, you know, like this big, giant man who was fierce, warrior, you know. But when he got saved, God changed his heart. And there was this tenderness to this, to this man as a result. God cares about the heart. He doesn't care what you look like. On the outside, he, he receives you and he wants to do this work on the inside. God is a heart surgeon, if you will. So then Jesus teaches us in verse 21 through 23, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire or in danger of Gehenna. So right away, Jesus in this interpretation of that commandment you should not kill you should not murder he reveals the shortcoming in the religious system because the Jews never really taught about the thoughts he, they never really taught or, or dealt with the mind what goes on in the mind and, and this is where they fell short because anger isn't it? It's anger that leads to murder. Murder is the result of anger. Therefore, anger is the problem. And therefore, what's going on on the inside is the problem, not really what goes on on the outside. What goes on on the inside is the problem. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? What does the mouth speak? The mouth doesn't think what to speak. I think of what to speak. My heart, my mind, who I am is the thing that's processing the information. And then my mouth is just this kind of physical thing on my face <laughs> that articulates what my thoughts are. Maybe not very well. <laughs> I tried to get out of preaching because I was always slow to speak, you know, but um, God wouldn't let me. The mind or the heart produces the thoughts, and the mouth just simply articulate. Our actions are attributed to the attitude of our heart. We need to be spiritual people. We need to be spiritual people, and that's something that is in word. Jesus saying that anger is the problem. We may have never killed a man. But who can say they never had road rage before? Just maybe a few guys that have never driven. <laughs> Wait till you get behind the wheel. I will cause road rage to come out of you, you know. <laughs> How many people have never been angry with somebody where you wanted to just beat them up and you've gone through in your mind, you know, how you're going to just pulverize this guy's face? Is that just me or is that, you know, is anybody else... Can somebody say amen? amen. Oh, thank you. I, you know, I want to make sure that I'm not revealing what, what kind of a sinner I really am up here. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> I shared before I've seen my son when he was in the crib still. And when he got hungry, he'd grab a hold of that crib and he would scream. And I just was praising God that this guy, this little thing that didn't have any self-control was confined to that crib and couldn't break out of it. Because if he could, he probably would, would have beat us all up. This, you could tell that there was this rage. I need food. You know? <laughs> Sorry that I wake the baby up. He might get mad at me and come at me later on in life. You know? Matt and Davina have their baby. Anger. 
means this word anger is to provoke or arouse to anger. And there's another word that deals with anger in the Greek, and it, it has the idea of getting mad real fast and then it passing. But not this word that we're dealing with. This word anger is a word long-lived anger. It is the anger of the man who nurses his wrath to keep it warm. It goes over and over in his mind. It is the anger over which a person broods and which he will not allow to die. And we've all had people that have angered us. And we went over and over in our mind. You know, um, how are you going to get them back? <laughs> James 1, 19 and 20. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And this wrath is the same word of anger. This anger that we possess as human beings that builds up and we think about it, you know, and we think maybe how we're going to at some point in life, we're going to get them back. That guy cut me off. Wait till I'm going to cut him back. I'm going you know, to win. You know, <laughs> I've seen videos on YouTube with road rage. You know, it's crazy what, is, what man is, you know, capable of. But Jesus forbids this anger. This anger is the sin that produces the action of murder. Jesus forbids forever the anger which broods, the anger which will not forget, the anger which refuses to be pacified, the anger which seeks revenge. You know, and then he says, uses this other, and whoever says to his brother Raka, what does Raka mean? That means not that he's a rocker. The rockers are not implied here, but it means like a senseless, like that's a stupid joke. You can say it. You know, just tell me afterwards that was a dumb one, Ron. Hey, but it woke you all up. So anyway. Um, so, Raka, a senseless, empty-headed man. And I want to read this translation by William Barclay because he explains that Raka is an almost untranslatable word because it describes a tone of voice more than anything else. Its whole accent, ascent, is the ascent to contempt. To call a man Raka was to call him a brainless idiot, a silly, a silly fool, an empty-headed blunderer. It is the word of one who despises another with an arrogant contempt. Right? This contempt that wells up in our hearts at times, you know, and it comes out in different ways, but um, it, it's something that we all have had to deal with in our lives. And, and to illustrate it, uh, there's, a, there's a rabbinic tale of a certain rabbi named Simon ben Eliezer. And he was, he was coming from his teacher's house, and he was feeling uplifted at the thought of his own scholarship and erudition and goodness. A very ill-flavored passerby gave him a greeting. The rabbi did not return the greeting, but said, You raka, how ugly you are. Are all the men of your town as ugly as you? <laughs> this guy was harsh, huh? <laughs> that said the passerby, I don't know. Go and tell the maker who created me how ugly is the creature he made. So there the sin of contempt was rebuked. <laughs> what, a, what a classic answer. But that kind of reveals this kind of, we, we say we worship God, but then we curse man. You know, we, we say something negative about God's creation. You know, things that fall under this category is that the contempt that comes from maybe the pride of birth, right? We're proud to be an American. Proud to be an American. I'm not proud to be a singer, though, right? Yeah, we're proud to be American, but when we look at that and we look on contempt with other people of different nationalities, that's sin. 
national pride. It's good to be proud of it, but then to look at other people in contempt. You know, just because you were blessed by being born here or whatever. It's sin. Race. Racism falls under this category. If you think because your skin color you're better than somebody else who has a different skin color, has a little bit more pigment in his skin than you do, you're in sin. You're just dealing, you're carnal. You're just dealing with this outwardness, you know? You're sold under sin, you're carnal. Position in society. You look at somebody who doesn't have the same position in society as you. you look at me, you know, I'm, oh, poor little Raka, you fool, you know? Well, I got more money than you. So I'm, a, I'm better than you. I look at you as contempt because you're poor. Because you, because you live under the bridge. I live over the bridge. <laughs> I'm in sin. You're in sin. Knowledge. You think because you have more mental capabilities than others. You look down on those that don't have the same mental capabilities. Or the same knowledge as you. And, and, you, and you suffer with those poor idiots. You raka. You're in sin. You're in sin. That's one thing I'll never have to worry about. <laughs> and then you fool. It means dull or stupid. As if shut up, you fool. Or heedless uh, and it has it's tied with morale morally like um, you're a fool morally moros also the, the greek word moros also means fool but the man who is moros is the man who is a moral fool to call a man moros was not to criticize his mental ability it was to cast aspirations on his moral character it was to take his name and reputation from him and to brand him as a loose, living, and immoral person. So in other words, there's more ways to kill a person than simply taking a knife or a gun and shooting them and killing their physical body. You can kill them, you can kill their reputation through slander, through your anger, because they did something to you, you're gonna get them back. Maybe you don't physically kill them, but you lash out in, in another way to kill their reputation. You look at them with contempt. The judgment is waiting for those people. Hellfire, Gehenna. What is Gehenna? It really means the Valley of Hinnon. And the Valley of Hinnon is a valley to the southwest of Jerusalem. It was notorious as the place where Ahaz had introduced to Israel the fire worship of the heathen god Molech, to whom little children were burned in the fire, and even Ahaz burned his sons as an offering in the valley of Hinnon. Can you believe that? In this valley, King Ahaz introduced the sacrifice of children to burn them on the arms of Molech in a fire. Josiah, the reforming king, his king, had stamped out that worship and had ordered that the valley should be forever after at a cursed place. So Josiah came in and said, that, we're going to wipe that out of that place. We're gonna, that place is a curse. It's not going to happen anymore. He defiled Topheth, which is the valley of the sons of Hinnon that no one might burn his son or his daughter as an offering to Molech, 2 Kings 23.10. In consequence of this, the Valley of Hinnom became the place where the refuse of Jerusalem was cast out and destroyed. It was a kind of public incinerator. Always the fire smoldered in it, and a pall of uh, thick smoke lay over it, and it bred a loathsome kind of worm, which was hard to kill. You know... And it talks about, Jesus talked about that in Mark. So Gehenna, the valley of Hinnon, became identified in people's minds with all that was accursed and filthy. The place where useless and evil things were destroyed. 
That is why it became a synonym for the place of God's destroying power for hell. So just because you haven't physically killed somebody doesn't mean that you've lived up to the law according to Jesus. If you've ever had this anger in your heart, any of those types of anger in your heart, you're guilty of that law. You're guilty of that law. And you deserve that punishment, eternal punishment. And of course, that's why Jesus came. We could never do it. We could never do it apart from him. You know, um, the application of this truth is in verses 24 and tw uh, through 26. But it says, leave, or um, in verse 23, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So be reconciled to your brother. And, and Jews believed that before a sacrifice could take place that the person had to be right. You had to kind of be it, it, holy. It was a very, um, it was a holy thing to offer a sacrifice. And if you remember, he had something against somebody else. He would leave his all, he would leave a sacrifice there. He would go reconcile with that person and then he would come back and offer it. But Jesus takes it to another level, doesn't he? It's a whole new level. From what the understanding of the scribes and Pharisees were. He says if somebody has something, if you know somebody has something against you, not if you have something against them, of course you got to deal with that, but if you know somebody has something against you, leave it at the altar and go and be reconciled. Everything should be done to keep the peace in the fellowship against your, if your brother has some, if, so, if your brother, or your sister, the body of Christ, if there's somebody that has something against you, Jesus says, it's your responsibility now to go to them. Of course, if you have something against somebody, you need to go to them, but it, it goes beyond that. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, gives us the steps. Jesus said, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So if he's, if he's got something, if he sins against you, go and deal with him directly. Between you and him alone. <laughs> well, sometimes we misinterpret that, don't we? And we want to share it with everybody. Just so they can pray for us, of course. Right? No. Go and share between him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. So if somebody does something to you, you're responsible as a Christian person not to gossip about it, not to talk about it with other people, but to deal with it mano y mano first. If he hears you, man, you, you've reconciled. It's a blessing. You, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear Take with you one or two more, that the mouth, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So then the next thing, get a couple other brother or sister to go with you and talk to that person with the heart of restoration. Confrontation should always be done with the motive of restoration. You never confront just to get even with somebody. That's not confrontation biblically. Confrontation is always with the motive to restore, to bring restoration. And if he won't hear the two or three, and he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. Take it to the church leadership. At that point, get the church elders, the deacons involved to help you. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. So if he doesn't listen to anybody, then you treat him like an unbeliever. How do you treat an unbeliever? You pray for him. You share the word with him. 
try to lead them to Christ. You don't, you don't throw things at them, right? You, how many people have unbelievers that, you, you know, you got to lead them to the Lord. That's, so you treat them like that. So this is the application of this. If there is any chance that anger is in my heart or in somebody else's heart, we do everything we can to deal with what the main thing, and that is the inward. Try to deal with that. If it's in me, if it's my brother, I try to help my brother through that process as well. So we can be spiritual people, not just religious people. And then he says, agree with your adversary, in verse 25, quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Surely I say to you, you by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. And so what's he talking about here? You know, he's talking about being humble and quick to admit your failures. You know, we're going to fail in this area. You're going to have road rage when you get your driver's license. And you're going to have to repent of it and, and ask God to deal with your heart. You know, when that anger comes up. You're going to fail in this area. And we need to be careful because our adversary, the devil, our adversary walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may you devour. And so this adversary that we have, what does he do? He's the accuser of the brethren. And sometimes he'll come and accuse us to bring us to this point of condemnation. And we've all gone through that. You know, we've all sinned and then we've fallen short. And, and then the devil will come and he'll start whispering in our ear and he'll start condemning us. Anybody else gone through that or just me? Right? And then you feel like you can't do anything. I can't serve the Lord. Now look at me. And, he, and he'll tell you that. And you call yourself a Christian. And now you're going to go preach the gospel to somebody. Now you're going to go set up the chairs for somebody. Look what you've done. Don't you know? You can't do anything for God now. And we begin we get condemned. I want to share with you a story from Martin Luther. Um, it, the story goes like this. The devil sought to discourage Martin Luther by making him feel guilty through rehearsing a list of his sins. When the devil had finished, Luther purportedly said, think harder. You must have forgotten some. <laughs> I love that. And the devil did think, and he listed more sins. When he was done enumerating the sins, Luther said, now with a red pen right over that list. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. Make the list. <laughs> Come on, that, there's more to it. That make, uh, you know, let me give you a few more that you forgot, Mr. Satan. I got more than that. Make the list as long as you want. Let him, let him, whatever he does, I feel like the word that went blank in my mind right there, getting old. <laughs> What's the word I'm looking for? Let him accuse me of a few more things. There it is. And when you're done making the list, I'll look it over. And I'll say you're right. And then I'll confess those sins. I will agree with my adversary quickly. I will humble myself and say, yes, I have fallen in those areas. I have sinned. And I will continue to fall short of the glory of God. And then what does John promise us as a result of that confession? Jesus will cleanse us, forgive us, and he will cleanse us from all of those sins. So when the devil is condemning you, fight against it with confession. Yes, I am that sinner. But God, Christ has died for such as me. You know. And then he says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks 
at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable that you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Again, it's the heart that is the problem. Right? Adultery is a, is a physical act that a person does. Um, it's fornication, or, or adultery and for, fornication both are perversions of God's sexual plan for human beings. God has blessed us with this desire and the fulfillment of the desire he has made a way for it, and that is for a man and woman to be married. God's plan for the husband and wife is to allow them to enjoy that sexual relationship. The marriage bed, according to the book of Hebrews, is undefiled. But anything outside of that marriage bed is sin. But that sin does not start just with that action. Where does it start? It starts on the inside, right? It's the lust in the heart that becomes the action. That becomes the action. You know, and I think we have all fallen into that. You know, I, that's why I try to dress modestly so I know I just want to, you know protect the ladies from stumbling and stuff, you know, but. <laughs> but, you know, that's the thing, you know, we, 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 you know, we know what stumbles us, right? Understand what stumbles the opposite sex. Because if your heart is right, you're not just thinking about yourself, you're thinking about others. And you don't want your brother or your sister to sin. You don't want them, you don't want to put them in a place where you're going to be a, a, a temptation to them. And so we need to understand what it is that tempts us and then to cut that out of our lives. It's not literally to cut off your limbs. You know, if I pluck out my right eye, I, right eye I still have my left one, right? If my right eye causes me to sin, I pluck it out, well, I still got my left eye. Then I'm going to pluck that out, and then I guess still got my right hand, so I'm going to pluck that off, you know, and I got my, well, now I don't have any hands to cut the rest of my members off. So it's not, it's not the limbs, it's not the body parts, it's, it's the situations. That's why in Hebrews chapter 12, 1, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So whatever those things are, whatever the sin, whatever causes you to sin, cut that out of your life. What is your weakness? Get it away from you. We all have weaknesses in various areas. Some people it is lust, the lust for the opposite sex. And an image in their mind, you turn into a magazine and there's an image and it, it, it fuels that fire, that passion, that lust that, that, you, that you may struggle with. So don't look at the magazine anymore, is the idea. If you watch TV, you know, and there's a, you know, the TVs nowadays, it's not PG, it's like, it's almost rated R, right? So you, you got to be wise in the things that you Put it, you know, people struggle with pornography. Well, if, if you struggle with pornography, then don't put the computer in a place where you can be alone with it. You know, put the computer in a place where everybody can see it, right? I always tell kids when they're having their relationship in the Bible college, have your relationship in public because I guarantee you're not going to fall in the coffee shop. 
when everyone's watching. Be wise, be smart. Well, you, well, we want to be alone. Well, why do you want to be alone? I guarantee the reason why you want to be alone is so you can do something so nobody else will see you. And you don't need to be doing anything else that nobody else can see. Right? <laughs> right? So understand that about yourself. Understand that about the guys, girls. That when they ask you to be alone, I'll tell you what they're looking for, if you don't already know. <laughs> it ain't rocket science. <laughs> Some people struggle, struggle with drinking, right? Well, don't go hang out in a bar. Cut that out of your life. We used to say, if you sit around in the barber shop long enough, you're going to get a haircut, right? It's not rocket science. So what it, what it is in your life that causes you to sin, cut that off. Cut it off. Cut it off at the pass. If it causes this inward man to drift towards an area of sin, cut it out of your life. And that's what Jesus is saying. It's good that you guys have never physically murdered anybody. It's good that you maybe have never committed physical adultery with anybody. But it doesn't mean that you're not guilty of murder, and it doesn't mean that you're not guilty of adultery. You're guilty as charged. We've all sinned according to Jesus' interpretation. You might have come in here thinking that you've done pretty good in life because you never did those things. And Jesus is just taking that foundation right from out from underneath you. Because if you've ever thought them, you're guilty. There goes your foundation. We don't want to just be religious people. We want to be spiritual people. Spiritual people who are right with God. Right with the Lord. And so if the worship team will come back up, we will close in a song. And let's pray together. So, Father.